the kinds of surgeries that we use to treat craniosynostosis varies quite a bit. And as you'd imagine, the kinds of craniosynostosis that affect a single suture, and here I have a model of a baby's skull made of plastic, although it's actually made from a, a real baby's CAT scan, so it's accurate. We can see the different cranial sutures here on a baby's head, and if a single suture is affected, then that surgery is generally much more expedi expedient. Um, where we have more complex cases, the syndromic craniosynostosis, where two or more of these sutures can be involved, those operations can typically be longer. But in either case, this is an operation that's done in either a morning or an afternoon. As a matter of fact, here we frequently do two of these kinds of operations in a day. Some of these operations will involve very small incisions and the use of telescopes or endoscopes to be able to operate underneath the skin. These are instruments that the pediatric neurosurgeons and the craniofacial surgeons have a lot of experience with. Um, and by making smaller incisions, there are certainly some advantages to what we can do. Uh, the operations can certainly get more complex from there, but I think one of the strengths that we have comes from the fact that we don't use a single recipe for every baby. Every baby that comes in, although there are predictable kinds of craniosynostosis, the degrees with which the baby is affected and the age at, with, at which the baby comes to us can be variable. And those things can very easily affect uh, what kind of outcome we might expect from each technique. So this is a normal baby's craniofacial skeleton. And uh, many people will recognize that on the forehead, there are two frontal bones separated by a metopic suture the anterior fontanelle or the soft spot, and then on either side, coronal sutures, which we can see here on the model, are all open. We can see these little wiggly lines. And then over the top of the head, the sagittal suture, and in the back, the lambdoid sutures. So this baby has normal open sutures, an open fontanelle, and because of that, the growth of the brain has been symmetric, and this is a normally shaped head. When those sutures become fused, things can get interesting. This is a baby that actually has the most common type of craniosynostosis, and I think if we look from the front, things look reasonably normal. But when we turn to the side, we can see immediately that the head is longer from front to back. And if we look from the top, we can see that in addition to it being longer here, it's narrower from side to side. I think you'd also notice that although the coronal sutures appear normal and the fontanelle appears normal, there's a ridge right up the middle of the skull here, which is where we previously saw a normal sagittal suture. This ridge is actually that sagittal suture af after it's fused. Because this is fused, these two parietal bones are being held firmly together, and the brain simply cannot grow left to right. But because the bones are thin and because the brain is growing rapidly, the brain is compensating by growing much further towards the back. And even if it's severe enough, we'll see a forehead that develops what we call bossing or prominence here. So we have the primary problem, which is the narrowing and lengthening, uh, and the compensational forces that occur. So without surgery, this would certainly become more noticeable with time. And in addition to the problems that we spoke about earlier, this can certainly become a psychosocial problem in school. Another kind of common, again, non-syndromic craniosynostosis is called coronal synostosis. And I think if we just look at the craniofacial skeleton from the front, we start to see that there's some asymmetry. Uh, the first asymmetry that people notice is that the eye sockets are asymmetric. The eye socket on this right side is distorted and actually sort of elongated in a vertical direction. 
you can start to see that the forehead is even uneven. And if you look from the top, the asymmetry of the forehead is even much more dramatic. Now, if we look at the sutures again, we can see the metopic suture is normal, the left coronal suture is normal, the sagittal suture is normal, but again, we see a ridge here along the right coronal suture. And this ridge then is restricting the growth of the frontal lobes forward on the right side. But again, because the bones are thin, the brain is able to compensate. It'll push harder on the left side and it'll push harder towards the back left and we'll start to get this really asymmetric trapezoidal shape. Now this is a more complex form because instead of simply occurring on the top of the skull, this now involves the orbits or the eye sockets. So the reconstruction here is obviously more complex and you can see why the neurosurgeons would need to work with craniofacial surgeons. And it's that team, the fact that we always work together, that really improves not only the safety, but improves our outcomes. Another kind of craniosynostosis that's not syndromic, but very interesting to me, is metopic synostosis. And if we look at this baby, again from the front, looks more symmetric, but I think you can appreciate that the orbits or the eye sockets are a bit closer together. And if we start to look from the top of the head, we can see that the, this sort of assumes a triangular shape. And this triangular shape is called trigonocephaly. And it results from this metopic suture down the middle of the forehead closing too soon. So we can see this ridge that forms, but even more important than the ridge is the fact that the two frontal lobes in the front are not being allowed to push out to the right and left. So it restricts the growth of the upper part of the orbital rim, and it forms this triangular shape. Again, the brain will do whatever it can, when it can, to get room, and it'll frequently push out to the back left and the back right. One of the reasons this is so interesting to me is that trigonocephaly, or fusion of the metopic suture, we always felt was a very rare kind of non-syndromic craniosynostosis. When I was a student, this was felt to occur in 2% of the babies with craniosynostosis. So 2% of the one in 2000 is very unusual. So one craniofacial surgeon at that time may see one or two a year at most. And now, over the past years, what I've seen is that this has become one of the more dominant forms of craniosynostosis that we see here. It may be that there's a selection bias here. This may be a kind of craniosynostosis that we get exceptionally good results on when other teams may not be getting those results. So then over time, we'll see more than our fair share. But this probably occurs in about a third to a half of our patients over the course of a year. So that change over um, a handful of years is remarkable to me. Um, I believe that this is being seen in other centers, but pretty selectively.